So welcome back to this uh, second presentation. Uh, the, uh, the other Michael is going to be a very uh, exciting speaker, I can tell you. Um, Michael has been uh, the executive director of the American Hardwood Export Council since 1999. So for everyone who has been um, you know, following hardwood markets globally for a while, EHEC has been probably the leader in uh, innovative marketing campaigns and, uh, and uh, progressive marketing. So uh, I'm glad to say that we are, we are lucky and fortunate to have him uh, on board uh, maybe to, to, to discuss a few of his uh, secrets. Uh, so Michael there as a oversee is overseeing the, the promotional programs around the club and he manages the overseas offices in Europe, Mexico, Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, and China. Before that, he has served uh, as AX program manager for Europe, China, and Japan. So Michael looks like a Ermile type of person. <coughs> he, he, uh, he holds also a master's degree in international economics from the George Washington University and a BA in developmental economics from the University of Wisconsin. Before joining AHEC, Michael has served as a consultant on the international education and travel programs for the National Geographic Society, so you'd better have good pictures, and the Smithsonian Associates. And the last one, Michael, is puzzling me to the point where I'm wondering what you are doing here. Michael has spent several years in Seville, in Spain, teaching economic courses in English and Spanish for the University of Wisconsin, and go figure, he has chosen to come back in the trade of lumber. So Michael is going to talk with us this afternoon about the international outlook for uh, Ardwood markets. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, the reason I left Spain was very simple. I was an illegal immigrant. <laughs> I got in the truck. Um, a couple of things I want to talk about. For those of you who don't know who AHEC is, I mean, we have a really a very simple mandate. We promote American hardwood exports. Um, that's really all we do. So it, it, it's kind of a good position to be in because we're able to focus all our energies on one, you know, one global mission. Um, as you mentioned, we do have offices around the world, but we also have um, staff on the ground in a number of countries. Where you see the blue here is where we have um, full-time consultants on the ground, but not brick-and-mortar offices that, again, are there to help um, carry out the marketing programs. When we step back and look at it, we receive quite a bit of funding from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to promote hardwoods as, a, you know, as an agricultural product from the U.S. And we sit back and look at it, what are the big um, challenges that are facing us as an industry? And what are the challenges that we can kind of take on and try to craft um, solutions to, or at least to help move the needle in the right direction? And the way that I look at it, the way we look at it, there's really three major issues that we need to attack globally. And the first one is to find new markets for grade lumber. And I'll talk in a little bit, and Mike touched on it before, about the difference between the high-grade markets, the, you know, the grade markets, and then your industrial markets. Um, grade markets have suffered quite a bit in the last 10 years in particular, and how do you get? That's the higher value. How do we develop new markets for that? And the second part that feeds right into that is new applications. I mean, too often... People look at, we've got to find new markets for our product. We've got to find the next China. And too often we equate a new market with a new geographical region, a new country, a new something else. Well, new markets are also new uses. And technology now has brought in, I think, real potential for hardwoods to be used in areas, ways they've never been used, tempered hardwoods. Things like um, thermal modification now suddenly allows it to be used in the exterior for decking, and my, my apologies to the softwood folks in the room, but there's a real possibility that the hardwoods that are thermally treated can take a big chunk of some of the decking markets around the world, um, things like cladding and so forth. Um, but also, I think, in the structural markets, in the construction markets, I think we've been doing some research on CLT, but using tulip wood, yellow poplar, instead of softwoods and CLT. And the, um, res the results have really been through the roof. The engineers are really excited. I'll talk a little bit about that. So it's finding new geographic regions, how we go about that, finding new applications, new ways to use it. But the third one is one that all of us, I don't care if you're hardwood, softwood, U.S. exporter, you know, a Canadian exporter, European exporter, we need to do a much better job than we do in selling the environmental credentials of wood. We're sitting on the greenest product in the world 
yet we're always playing defense. We have to hide our face and tell our children, yeah, we're in the wood industry because we're chopping down the trees and taking away Bambi's home. We all know that's not the truth, but that's the perception that's out there. And it's out there amongst architects, it's out there amongst the designers, it's out there amongst the general public. How do we start to change that? And I think we have all the data we need, we have all the ammunition, we have plenty of bullets, we just haven't really done a very good job of getting that message out. We sit in a lot of rooms like this and talk to ourselves about it, but all of us need to do a much better job of getting that message out to the wider world. So the first thing I talk about, we want to finding the new markets. It really depends on, on what the new markets are when we talk about you know, finding new areas for, the, for, um, for lumber, new uses. We try to hit all, all the areas of, of the decision-making process. You know, you got to start with the importers and distributors because if you go into a new country like India, if there isn't wood on the ground, if there isn't someone who knows how to buy it, who knows what the grading system works like, who knows the difference between the temperates and how you handle those compared to the tropicals they're used to dealing with, then there's no sense talking to architects and getting them excited because the wood's not on the ground. So essentially, we kind of target our activities around the world depending on where the specific market is. Europe, they know temperate hardwoods very well. They know they know North American hardwoods very well, so a lot of our energy there goes into talking to the, to the architects and the designers. Essentially, your customers' customers, so we try to pull the demand there as opposed to pushing it through the trade that we would do in a, in a less developed market. So when I talk about the, um, everybody here knows what's happened in the last few years, particularly in the eastern U.S. with production. Going back to the, to the heyday of 1999, I mean, we know production has fell way off starting to creep back up a little bit, a little bit, but we're still less than half of where production was just 15, you know, 15, 16 years ago. There's a lot of upside, but not only are we down there, but what's coming off the sawmills has changed drastically. The other one can be best understood, I think, by taking a look at this. These blue bars here represent domestic U.S. consumption of grade lumber. So that was the furniture industry, um, primarily the furniture industry, cabinet industry, and so forth. If we look at what happened before the housing crisis in the mid-2000s and afterwards, our domestic consumption of grade lumber has absolutely collapsed. And this is a change. This is not a cyclical change. This is a structural change in the market. Yes, we'll have some, you know, some of the offshoring is going to come back a little bit, but we're never going to be back to where we were in 1999. So where is the consumption? What, what can we do to make sure that when things are made of wood anywhere in the world, that North American hardwoods is part of the picture. Also, Mike had alluded to a little bit earlier, too, again, on what's coming out of the sawmills. If we look back again 10 years ago in 2005, it was actually the opposite of what it is now. So 60% of what came off the sawmill in 2005 was grade lumber. And 40% of that came off it was industrial lumber. In the last 10 years, that's been flipped completely on its head. Now it's 60%, as Mike pointed out, is industrial timber. That obviously has some pretty important ramifications as far as profitability, as far as pricing and things like that for the wood that comes out of the sawmill. The trees obviously haven't changed in the last 10 years. Where those markets are going have absolutely changed in the last 10 years. Another interesting one when we talk about housing, because I think this has slipped a lot of people by. We've always looked at our housing markets as being the key indicator for American hardwood consumption, particularly prices. But following the crisis in 2006, 2007, something fundamental changed. If you follow along here, this actually comes from the Weekly Hard Review, How We Review, the, um, um, the price index here, which is in purple. And these are housing starts. You can see, if you can follow this all the way back to the 1950s, there was a very, very close correlation between housing starts and prices. But after, after the crisis in the mid-2000, the housing crisis, something happened. Something changed. Housing prices remained low, but we saw this huge spike in hardwood lumber pricing index. So what is it that decoupled the domestic housing market from lumber prices? And I think very simple, it's exports. That's, that's, that's the answer to that question. Exports came in and became a bigger and bigger piece of the puzzle. The U.S. is by far the biggest exporter of hardwood lumber in the world. But prior to, this goes to 2014 because we don't have the 2015 numbers yet from the rest of these countries. We know we were down a little bit in 2015, um, but it was still the second highest ever for U.S. hardwood exports. But look at, compare the growth in the previous five or six years in the U.S. to 
to any of the other major suppliers. And also take a look at a couple of these countries moving forward, Indonesia, um, Malaysia, Thailand, because these are countries that are big exporters, you'll see in a second in their own right. The fact that they're coming on to become big importers of American hardwood, I think says an awful lot about changing tastes in the furniture industry around the world. So we all know that the overseas markets are becoming more and more important, but I don't think people really have a handle on exactly how important it is. This graph, and it's a couple years old now, but I think this really jumps out at you. This is a, this is a graph that was done by the United Nations talking about middle-class consumers around the world. Where are the middle-class consumers? And middle-class consumers by the United Nations means you know, household income of $25,000, which to us doesn't seem like very much, but it is in most countries around the world about the, about the area where you start to have your own home, where you start to have things like furniture that you buy yourself, that you start to you know, perhaps put some flooring or something. Where is that happening? And overwhelmingly, it's the developing countries. You've had going from below poverty to above poverty in the last decade in China, half a billion people almost double the U.S. population, just in 10 years, has moved from below the poverty line to above the poverty line. We have never in human history seen anything like that before. Never seen anything like that before. And that's why when we start talking about markets moving forward and talking about China, I think it's a market that's really not very well understood in the U.S. We still tend to look at it as it's just a, a, a screwdriver factory. We're sending raw materials. They're making finished goods and sending it right back out. 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, that was definitely true. Now it's domestic consumption in China that's driving things, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more moving forward. When we talk about the largest importers in the world, it's even more uh, striking than it is when we talk about the largest exporters. I mean, look at China um, bringing in all of that wood. For the U.S. in 2015, you know, China, again, Greater China, which takes... Which takes um, um, Taiwan and Hong Kong into the picture as well. Um, by far the biggest, the EU 28 next. Canada still hanging in there, then Vietnam and Mexico. We look at changes from the major markets over the last five years, and again, China sort of leads the pack, but some interesting trends. We're starting to see Japan slowly creep back into the picture. But again, when I talk about, look at places like Vietnam, but Thailand, Malaysia, again, two major, two major hardwood, you know, sawn hardwood lumber producing countries, two big exporting countries, but now they're starting to import more and more um, tempered hardwoods from the United States, particularly for their re-export furniture industry. So when I talked before about China and the changes in China, where we understood it, and, and I look around the room, there's enough of us here that remember back in the days when, you know, Japanese and cheap Japanese labor was going to drive all of us out of business. Japan now has the most expensive labor in the world. China's moving in the same direction. We had in the early years, starting in 1999 till about the crisis in 2006, probably a big chunk of this growth of our exports to China did feed companies on the coast that manufactured furniture, manufactured flooring, turned it around, sent it right back out of the country. Then when the U.S. and Europe housing crisis began in the mid-2000s, you had Chinese, Chinese manufacturers with lots of capacity saying, what do we do? Our markets are drying up. What do we do? Where can we find large numbers of consumers? Hey, wait a minute. We're in China. We have large numbers of consumers. And all of a sudden, they turned their production and they turned their goals inland. So even while the U.S. remained and, and Europe, which is still mired in recession, remained low, look what happened to our exports to China. They took off, and even at a much faster rate. That's domestic consumption in China that's driving that big growth. That's not the re-exports of furniture. Does leave a couple of problems, though, or a couple of things to worry about, I would say, long-term. If you look at where our exports are with China and without China, you know, the idea of having a lot of eggs in one basket certainly jumps into mind, and there's a lot of things going on in China right now that I think do have people, um, do have people worried. You know, China's kind of hit a wall. Over the last 15 years, we've seen these high growth rates but these have been high growth rates in China that have been dependent very heavily on government spending, on infrastructure spending, massive, you know, massive government spending on airports, on rail systems, on highway systems, on infrastructure in cities. Massive government spending, and what people don't realize, deficit spending. 
The Chinese now actually have a debt to GDP ratio that's over 100% of their GDP. Ours is approaching 20% and we're very nervous. China's is now above that. China also has a couple of, I think, you look long term, China has some real, real issues they're going to need to face. And the biggest one probably is a demographic issue. And again, this is something that nobody seems to be talking about. And if I was a, if I was a uh, policymaker in, in China, it would certainly keep me awake at night. And the way it goes essentially is this. Right now, the Chinese economy has been expanding very rapidly, but it's been expanding very rapidly because the bulk, the vast majority of the population is in that category that Dan was talking about, that, that Mike was talking about, between 25 and 65. You have very few people older than that because so many died from the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, so you don't have a lot of old people proportionally in China. You have very few people under that because of the one-child policy. So China's sitting right now on a huge demographic time bomb where all of those people in that big bubble are a working age. As that bubble ages and you don't have people below them, there's going to be some serious problems that China's going to need, and they're going to need to address those with immigration, which is the way we've addressed it. And the reason that the United States is moving forward and we're still growing and Europe and Japan are not. Um, can I go backwards there? But let's talk about China again. When we talk about the, the, wood, you know, the furniture, yes, China is huge. They're a big furniture manufacturer. They manufacture a lot, by far the biggest in the world. So, of course, they're flooding the world's markets. But again, when you talk about China, you're talking about a problem always of scale. Because when you, when you c compare China's overall production of wood furniture with their domestic consumption versus exports, a very different story emerges. If you look now, this... This lower line here, this, this is Chinese furniture exports. So this is the number that corresponds to this. This is overall production of wood furniture in China. They're only exporting about 17% of their production. You compare that to all of the other major furniture manufacturers in the world, Italy in its heyday exported about 93% of its furniture. Canada, I don't know what your export is. It's got to be around 90% of the wood furniture made in Canada is exported. Um, Poland, it's above 90%. China, it's 17%. The rest of that is being consumed domestically. And that's the part of the equation that I don't think we understand very well, certainly in the United States. And when we look at it, I think there's a lot of room for growth still in China away from the coasts. A lot of this early stuff was in cities down here, in Shenzhen and Guangzhou, in from, in from Hong Kong here, up along Shanghai and Tianjin, up along you know, Qingdao, areas along the coast. This is where a lot of the growth was, and this is where the re-export industries developed. And, and as a result of that, you had huge migrations, largest migrations in human history, moving from here to the coast. And you've got the Chinese government now trying to reverse that migration. They're trying to get people, they're trying to develop the center, the Western strategy, they're trying to develop the center. So there's actually a lot of opportunities, I think, for raw materials. And wood, which is a building material, has been deemed a strategic material by the Chinese government. So there's actually programs to help subsidize getting those raw materials from the coast into these interior cities where they're needed. Now, as a foreigner, you can't tap into that, but if you have a Chinese partner, you can. So there are programs, you get it to Shanghai, they'll get it to Chongqing for you at, at you know, rates that are subsidized by the government. They're trying to develop these cities. And there's a lot of upside. There's a lot of development going on. We're going to be having in June in the city of Chongqing, which is actually the largest urban area in the world, if you take the sort of the, the triangular cities that are there at Chongqing, it's 36 million people in this area right here. They're trying to keep as many of those people there. This is the headwaters of the Yangtze River. They're developing a huge tourism infrastructure built around the, you know, the Yangtze River cruises and so forth. You've got a lot of opportunities, again, for wood that's going to go into China and is going to stay in China, and these interior cities have not been touched yet. So when people say China's coming to an end in this, there's a lot of upside still. We're not going to be looking at the same kind of growth rates we've had before, but their eyes think still there's a lot of upside to the Chinese economy or to the Chinese market for hardwoods. And if you look at it just purely on a per capita wood, consum you know, wood consumption uh, basis, of course, as I said before, when you're talking scale with China, per capita anything is a little bit dangerous to talk about. But it certainly does give you the impression that there's plenty of room still for growth in China's use and in China's uh, you know, use of wood and wood from North America. 
Also, when you look at where China's imported sawn wood's coming from right now, um, again, we've got a fairly small piece of the pie. We've got a very small piece of the pie right now. If you look at all these areas, Thailand, Laos, you know, Russia, of course, nobody knows what's coming over the border from Russia right now, but there's a lot of very suspect um, supply areas there that aren't going to be around for a long time. A lot of them are not going to be around for very much longer at all. So the, uh, the potential for this part of a, even a stagnant Chinese, economy, um, Chinese hardwood market, our chance of getting a bigger piece of that pie, I think, is very, very good moving forward. We have the resource to do that. Of course, there's been a lot of talk about the, 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 the RMB getting weaker. I think it's going to get weaker again, and it's really it's economics working. It's not a nefarious plot by the Chinese to undercut everybody. Um, they're, if they are going to grow, they're running out of, out of potential now of how much you can still use deficit spending and government infrastructure. Um, they've pretty much connected all the cities by highway, by high-speed trains. Now they're starting to look, they're just starting now, they've just finished the, or just starting the, the fifth five-year plan, and they're going right back to government infrastructure again. So this is, you're going to start to see, I think, slowing growth down, because now you're looking at projects like, we're going to build a high-speed train from here to here that really doesn't make economic sense, but it's going to be something because it's going to put people to work and we're going to start spending at. So the returns on these investments, I think, are going, to start to, are going to start to go down a little bit in China. And then as they start to ease credit, they're trying to, they're trying to change the growth model from this you know, um, government spending, infrastructure-led growth to consumer-led growth. That's, the, that's, the, that's the, the golden ticket for the Chinese. That's what they're trying to achieve. And to do that, they need to make credit cheaper. And if you make credit cheaper, it's going to continue to drive the value of the currency down. So I think we're going to see probably a further devaluation of the RMB. But again, it's not the Chinese government doing nefarious, hey, let's, let's undercut everybody else. It's economic forces. It's the same reason that the euro is collapsing. It's the same reason that the peso is collapsing in Mexico. So we move out of, we move out of Southeast Asia. You want to know your re-export market. Here it is. It's Vietnam. This is where all of that furniture, a lot of it originally Taiwanese owners that opened those factories in southern China, they've moved them now to Vietnam. Vietnam is a huge, huge um, uh, manufacturer of furniture, big exporter of furniture, but very little domestic consumption. Hopefully, China will, hopefully Vietnam will follow what China's done. We'll start to see more domestic consumption. I think there's some good opportunities there. And I think we might start seeing um, this... This big burst of re-export furniture is probably going to move to Laos or Cambodia or Myanmar. There's always going to be cheaper labor somewhere else. So it went from Japan to China, China to Vietnam. It's going to go from Vietnam to somewhere else. If you're chasing cheap labor, there's always going to be somewhere else with cheap labor. So the key is how do we get Vietnam to transition into a consumption market as well as a re-export market. Um, Japan, still a decent market. They had really, really good growth until 2015, but again, they're still... I mean, they're looking now at almost negative, uh, negative interest rates in Japan. I mean, you, there's only so much you can do to stimulate a debt economy, and I think Japan's still got some problems here. But Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, these are all countries that are trying to emulate this, trying to increase their, their exports, and they're looking at furniture as a possibility to do that. They're realizing they're sitting on a big basket, but they're sitting on a rubberwood basket. Nobody in the West wants rubberwood furniture. So now we're starting to see Indonesian, Malaysian companies that are importing wood from the U.S., importing wood from Canada, importing wood from Europe um, to try to increase their, um, what they're able to offer on exported furniture. Southeast Asia's been a pretty good one. I mean, the, the white oak, of course, dominates in Southeast Asia, but yellow poplar's been a very good market down there. The tulip wood has been a very, very good market there. But a, good, a nice, good spread of species going into Southeast Asia. Um, and again, where can we grow? Even in Vietnam, it's as big as that market's been for us for the last few years, we're only 12% of, of their imported sawn hardwoods. This doesn't even take um, logs into account. This is just sawn hardwoods. Again, we have a chance, I think, even if the, Chinese, if the overall Vietnamese market remains flat, I think our potential to increase that slice of the pie, I think it's considerable. So again, it's not just markets that necessarily are growing. I think there's a lot of opportunities, and Vietnam is one, where we can see a bigger piece of a pie that's maybe growing more slowly, um, but is still growing. If we look at the next destinations, Japan, um, the UK, Italy, Spain, it's good to see Spain sort of start to come back. Um, but I have a lot, of, a lot of ties to Spain. It, it, used, to, it used to be able to, uh, to justify several trips a year to Spain. It's harder to do that now. 
um, with, with where, this, where the Spanish market's been. Um, but the Middle East is coming on strong. There's a lot of good markets out there. Within Europe, you know, Italy for years and years and years had been by far the biggest market. Italy remains a basket case, unfortunately, and it doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. The UK did show tremendous growth for a five or six year period, a little bit of a fall off in, in 2015, but again, 2015 remains the second highest year ever for sales to the UK. So people focus on, yeah, it's fallen off, but it's still the second best year ever for sales to the UK. Um, and the pound has held its value a little bit better against the dollar than the euro has, so that's helped, um, but it is slipping a little bit. And again, we look again at, at Europe, it's another way of looking at it, where we've been the last couple of years. Really, the only consistent growth over the last few years has been Spain, but starting from a pretty low number. And when you consider in 2005, for lumber and veneer, Spain was actually the biggest market anywhere in the world for U.S. hardwoods. The euro, we all know what's happening there, um, making it more and more difficult, very similar to here we, we talked when, when Mike was here before, we talked about the, the Canadian dollar to the U.S. dollar. We have a very similar um, situation right now with, with the euro. Um, anything coming out of the U.S. is very expensive in Europe, and that's certainly not helping. And again, the European economies remain pretty mired in, um, I don't know if you can call it a recession anymore, but it's anemic growth at best. Some popular areas are some, some, some good areas, not big volumes, but I think real good growth potential. The Middle East, I think, remains good. The um, Dubai, the Emirates, actually has a pretty sophisticated um, architectural molding and millwork industry. They do a lot of work for high-end hotels all over the world, and the millwork's being done in Dubai. But it's also a trading center for the rest, for the rest of um, not only the Gulf states, but the Middle East. Um, Turkey, very sophisticated furniture industry. Um, very, very good market in, in Turkey moving forward. Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, look at Pakistan the last several years. Difficult place to do business, but they'll come to the Dubai Wood Show. They'll come, they'll come meet with the U.S. guys. Um, and, you know, and again, a lot of these taken together, um, Jordan's a decent market, New Zealand, Australia, they're all relatively small, but they're all important niche markets, and a lot of these are buying things like, well, you got the white oak in, in Australia, but you're starting to see things like cherry starting to go into some of these markets now. So you've got a lot of small markets, but taken together, they're pretty significant numbers of, uh, you know, pretty significant volumes. And again, as we're trying to increase the spread and not have all of those eggs in that China basket, developing some of these smaller markets um, becomes more and more important moving forward. Mexico has been a really interesting one. When we start talking about, um, you know, offshoring and then reshoring, I think Mexico is a really, really interesting um, case study. Um, Mexico lost out big time when China started exporting a lot of furniture to the U.S. We used to have, remember before NAFTA, the maquiadora sector along the border where they would manufacture things, send them back, in, back to the U.S. Between NAFTA and the rise of China, a lot of the furniture manufacturing along the border was pretty much wiped out. It's hard to get a feel for how much of the Mexican industry is built on re-exports right now, but I think if you look at the last several years and then you compare, look at this increase going to Mexico the last several years, and then we, we can compare to, this is actually the weakening of the peso, which has almost fallen in half. It certainly leads you to believe that an awful lot of that is simply an input that's being re-exported back into the United States. And when you combine that with the fact that actually wages in Mexico are lower than they are in coastal China, I think Mexico, again, as a re-export market, um, is increasing. I'd love to see Mexico develop more as a consumption market. We're seeing some movement in that direction. Um, but certainly nothing to, uh, I think, to get, to get too excited about. And that's, been, that's kind of the holy grail. Is how do you tap that, that, that high-end market in Mexico? Because there is a high-end market there, um, but floors are made out of tile. That's just the way it is. You don't use wood. And how do you change that mindset? Um, start on the second part, new market segments. We start, I, I, I touched on it very early at the beginning. I think there's a real possibility now with new technologies that there's, there's ways that we can use uh, North American hardwoods now that we've never used before. That's going to open new markets for us. Um, exterior and structural are really the two main ones. You look at exterior joinery, of course, tempered hardwoods have never really been used in the exterior before. But now thermal modification is changing the equation. This started back about 10, 10 years ago we had this bench built by a, a, a famous uh, um, uh, furniture manufacturer in the UK that's sitting out in front of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, if you ever go. 
of, of I think it's eight different American hardware species that were thermally modified. And um, Imperial College in London has been monitoring this and seeing how it's reacting over time. Obviously, the, uh, the weather in England is rainy, cold, wet, and this bench is, is absolutely maintaining its color, it's maintaining its integrity. It's, uh, I think it's been a real success. And it's opened a lot of people's eyes to the potential for using these, um, for using these areas where we haven't. And it's opened up a new market now. And if you look at in Europe, here's the, um, the Museum of European and Mediterranean Civilizations in Marseille. And what you see behind you, that is the Mediterranean Sea back there. So it is a very wet oceanfront climate. All of the decking you see there and all of that trellis work you see there is all thermally modified American ash. You wouldn't have seen that before thermal modification. We're seeing it now in London. Cladding, the Europeans love their cladding. This is something that's never been available to, to tempered hardwoods before. It is now. Windows, this is a really interesting experiment in the UK. In 1980, out of exterior windows in the UK, they said roughly 90% of all exterior windows in 1980 were made out of wood. By 2010, that number was less than 10% of exterior windows were made out of wood. Thermal modification suddenly opens that back up where you get the beauty of wood, but now you don't get the movement, you don't get the cracking, you don't get the swelling, you don't get that. This, this could reopen a whole market that was really lost to solid wood um, and hardwoods in particular um, two decades ago. Here's a chance again. This is not necessarily new consumption, but it's getting back old consumption that we've lost. Structural design is the next one. We did, we started going back 15 years ago. We had all the American hardwood species, first of all, tested for um, building codes in the UK or in, in, in the European Union, because the first thing, you've got to be in the building codes before you can even think about it. Um, but we started looking into CLT. There's been a lot of talk about CLT, and most CLT now has been, um, has been softwood panels. How would hardwoods produce? What's a species that we have an awful lot of low-grade timber in? Tulip wood, soft maple, I mean, I'm sorry, in, um, uh, yellow poplar, tulip wood. There's really not a good outlet for low-grade soft, for low-grade tulip wood. So we thought, let's build some CLT panels, let's build a demonstration project and see how it works out. We work with an architect out of the Netherlands whose father was actually a student of M.C. Escher, for those of you who know the artist M.C. Escher, and what he wanted to do was build a 3D representation of M.C. Escher's endless stairs. So what we did is we built, the, using CLT panels, we put together an entire full staircase that went out in front of the Tate Modern on the, uh, um, on the bank of the Thames River in London. Um, about 46, 48,000 people um, climbed this thing during the, during the three weeks of the London Design Festival. They got a chance to see not only the structure, how it performed. We were working with engineers from Arup, and they were absolutely blown away by how this performed. They started comparing it to the softwoods they'd been using for CLT. And for bending strength and everything else, the hardwoods by far, by far outperformed the softwoods. This gets the engineers excited because suddenly now you can have the same strength and use much smaller members, much thinner panels, and still have the same strength. This opens a lot of possibilities. We're going to be doing this year in the London Design Festival a full size. We're actually going to be building a building um, in, uh, in King's Cross using full size tulip wood CLT panels. So more on that. You'll start to see it um, in the press later. And this, I think, can be changing. And this is where we start to morph into the whole environmental messaging. Because when you talk about building out of wood and the potential to build multi-story buildings out of wood, not just two-story homes or three-story homes, but multi-story um, homes out of wood, multi-story buildings out of wood, CLT allows you to go up 9, 10. I think Australia, they've got a 16-story building that's going to be going up in Australia made out of CLT. And then when you start looking at the environmental impacts of that, this was an interesting one in London. Okay, this was completed. This was one of the first using CLT. But four carpenters um, produce this building rate of one story a week. The building weighs 300 tons, which is a quarter of the weight um, of the similar building with either concrete or steel. So that, of course, has important implications as far as how deep the foundation needs to be dug, how long it takes to do it, and everything else. But look at this last one. This building saves 306 tons of carbon compared to the exact same building made out of steel frame or concrete. When you start looking at the amount of building going on in the world, 
and people worrying about what are we going to do about carbon, what are we going to do about this, here you have not only where it uses less, but it's actually sequestering carbon the whole time. This can open up a whole new world for building. And again, we tend to look at in this industry for too long, I've heard this industry talking about environmental movements and environmental groups, that's just the greenies out to get us. They could be our biggest allies on this. We want them to look in what are the environmental impacts. We want them to focus on that because when they do, wood really stands out. I think this is the last part I want to talk about. And there's no wonder people are confused on environmental impacts. You Google or just do Google images for, you know, for green label. This is the first of 80 pages that'll come up. So people are turned off by it. And at the same time, we are dealing with the perception that wood is scarce. We can't cut down trees. You know, everybody knows trees are disappearing, but they're not disappearing. And this is where we have the facts to show they're not disappearing, but we talk to ourselves. This is not well known. All the school kids know about the 50 football fields a second or whatever ridiculous number they're using now of tropical forests disappearing. But actually, the temperate hardwood forests are not only not disappearing, they're actually increasing too quickly, which I'll talk about in a second. But look at the thing. Between 1990 and 2000, we had 21 billion cubic meters of additional growth in the, US, in, in the, I'm sorry, in the global temperate hardwood forests. Okay, non-tropical, this is temperate hardwood forest, 21 billion cubic meters, net increase, increase. That's enough to build a, a solid one meter high wood, wooden fence from the earth to the sun and back. That's the increased wood, not the total wood stock. So that's just spending your interest. You can have that much or build that same fence 7,500 times around the equator. That's your additional wood that grew in that decade. And it actually accelerated in the next decade. So 2000, 2010, we looked at 1.3 billion cubic, cubic meters a year of additional wood in, this, in, the world's, in the world's temperate hardwood forests. That's enough to build 58 million two-story homes every year. That's what, 10 times the global housing starts last year? And that, again, is just the increase in the wood. That's not spending your principal. That's just spending the interest. The wood is there. In fact, there's cases now, we've got um, a good chunk of that. It's in North America, the United States, in fact, we're responsible for about half of that um, on the hardwood forest. But you've got the point now, when you think about the implications of this, you have the United Nations saying their biggest concern on the U.S. hardwood forest is that we're not cutting it fast enough. It's not that we're cutting too many trees. We're not cutting enough trees. This message doesn't get out there. And why is that a problem? Okay, 2.4 2 to 1 is our growth to removal ratio. But look at that last number, mortality in the forest of 109 million cubic meters that we allow to die in the forest. Now, I'm not saying every single tree that finds, I mean, obviously, dying trees is part of the ecosystem. It feeds everything else. We're not going to bring every tree. Um, but there is certainly room to increase harvesting levels in, in the United States. And when people talk about using our forests as carbon sinks, and yes, our forests are tremendous carbon sinks, but the science tells us if we want to maximize the potential of using the forest as a carbon sink, you have to actively manage the forests. So the green groups that say, oh, we can't touch the forests because they're carbon sinks, actually, if you want to maximize the amount of carbon, you need to actively manage it. If you can remove those trees before they die, allow the new trees to take their place because it's the new trees that start to absorb the carbon. There's been st studies done showing that as you actively manage the forest, the potential of carbon storage for each acre increases dramatically. It increases dramatically. So again, this is a story that come out where actually cutting down trees is good for the environment. It's good on the carbon storage perspective, and it's good on the environmental perspective. But that's not the message that's out there. This one I pulled out of a magazine because I couldn't believe it. This, this was something that came out on AP Wire and BBC News two years ago now, where a new global monitoring system has been launched that promises real-time information on deforestation around the world. Forest campaigners say it's the equivalent of 50 football fields of trees being cut down every second. Now, those numbers are, are, are whether they're in dispute or not, the whole key is where you see deforestation, 70% of deforestation around the world taking place in two countries. It's Indonesia and it's Brazil. And in neither case does it have anything whatsoever to do with the forest products industry. In Indonesia, it's palm oil. It's the Europeans who say, we need biofuels, we're going to subsidize biofuels. So they're actually leading to the complete destruction of the rainforest in Indonesia so they can wipe out the trees, plant a cash crop, which is your, your, your um, palm oil, biofuels, 
the World Wildlife Fund comes along and, and, and uh, certifies it all as being wonderful, and here's your rainforest disappearing. The same thing in, in Brazil, where you're seeing the rainforest disappearing in Brazil, the wood's not even being used. It's going into, into soybean production. Again, a lot of it for biofuels, because that's much better for the environment. So it's going in and trees are being wiped out. So, when you, so, so to talk, first of all, that somehow using wood is what's leading to deforestation is complete BS. But the second one, look at, the, look at what they use here for a, um, as a map. You might be surprised to know there's not a tree standing south of the Mason-Dixon line in the U.S. Look at Canada. Boy, you guys have really wiped out your forests up there. This actually shows usage. So this is where harvesting takes place. It doesn't take into account regrowth. But this is the map that goes out and was printed in about 180 different newspapers and magazines around the world. This is where people get their information on forestry issues. And our competitors are using it to their advantage. I love this one. Say no to wood, say yes to Kalinga stone, and do your best to conserve nature. Look at this. Because use of wood leads to deforestation and massive destruction of nature. Kalinga stone, it's not a stone. It's actually a, a petroleum-based PVC plastic. You talk about something that's not environmentally friendly, but hey, we're not chopping down trees. I love this one too. Einwood, looks like wood, feels like wood, smells like wood. And, and again, here you have the same thing. We protect primeval forest. Our objective was to develop technology to create a wood superior and natural, natural wood in order to, and I love this, to combat the thoughtless lumbering of forest trees. The Japanese do have a wonderful way with words. We may run out of aluminum, but not, we may not run out of wood, but not aluminum. Yeah, no environmental problems there with aluminum. Bauxite mining, no environmental impacts. And my all-time favorite, steel, the ultimate sustainable material. I mean, really, how are we losing this debate in the wood industry? But we are. We are losing this debate. You talk to the average people. You go to a high school class, an environmental sciences class. Oh, well, now more steel than ever is being recycled, so steel's good. We're losing this because we have no voice, and it's frustrating. I'm not even going to start talking about checkoffs and things in the U.S. that we had before, but it's pretty frustrating. We have the science. We did a full life cycle. I know you've done one here um, in Canada as well. But we did a full life cycle showing not only the operations in the forest um, of you know, going in, removing the trees, trans transforming them or transporting them to the sawmill, the sawmill operations, the kiln dried operations, the packaging operations, and also, and this is the key, the shipping to ports overseas. And in each one of those cases, you see the zero line up there? That's carbon neutral. What you have in the red below is the carbon that's stored, that's sequestered in the wood. What you have above that is all of the carbon emissions for all of the, um, for all the different steps I talked about, including transport, in this case, to the Japanese market. And this is important when you start talking to architects in places like Australia, who say, okay, North American wood, yeah, it might be good. We understand you're doing a good job with your forests, but if I'm in Australia, you're shipping me the wood all the way here, that's got to override any possible environmental impact, you know, environmental benefits of using the wood in the first place. Well, unless you're putting it on the Concorde, no, it doesn't. There's actually a very little impact, um, particularly for, car for, for carbon usage, um, from the shipment. And this has allowed us to put in what we've called, we haven't done, everybody knows what EPDs are. Whoops. I, I just put this one in here. This is your, your two-minute elevator speech. When people talk about, you know, what you do, what you do in two minutes. This is one we should all have on the tip of our tongue, like the 50%. For each cubic meter of concrete that we don't use and we substitute a cubic meter of timber, a full ton of CO2 is removed from the atmosphere. Keep that one in your head when people talk about concrete and new low-carbon concrete. But EPDs, which are designed, I think everybody here, is everybody here familiar with EPDs? I know you're actually more advanced here in Canada than we are in the States on, um, on, on EPDs. We decided not to do an EPD for American hardwood lumber for one pretty simple reason. Um, we don't have an end-of-life scenario because a piece of lumber is not consumed as a piece of lumber. It goes into a you know, piece of furniture, a piece of flooring, or whatever. Um, and then once you have that, you're going to have an end-of-life scenario where you can calculate your full environmental product declaration. So what we've done is we provided the information in ISO-specific life cycle information, including delivery to whatever port around the world um, for manufacturers of downstream um, products that want to do their own EPDs. 
And we're starting to see Italian furniture manufacturers that are making use of this. We've seen now flooring, you know, flooring manufacturers around the world that are making use of this as well. It also gives us the opportunity through our marketing to show, you know, not only talk about it and show the beauty of wood, but to bring all these messages together. And we've used now a couple of platforms. We did during the London Design Festival a couple of years ago and Out of the Woods, where we did a furniture design competition, which is not just a furniture design competition like before, but in this case, each one of the students had to do a full environmental accounting on, on their products. What happens if I use this glue instead of this? What happens if I use metal screws as opposed to wood pegs? How does that change things? Um, and again, by doing this and then going out to the press and going out and developing the interest, this is how you get that message out across. Um, and this has formed the basis of a lot of PR campaigns that we've been doing around the world. Um, the same thing with the stairs I talked about earlier. We did a full environmental impact accounting of those stairs, of every step along the way from the raw material from the forest all the way through the sawmill to shipping the lumber to Italy. In Italy, the CLT panels were manufactured in Italy. Then those panels were set to, sent to Switzerland where they were manufactured into the stairs itself, then containerized, shipped to London, and then it was put up on the, on the shores um, or on the, on the banks of the Thames River you can count or you can add up the environmental impacts at every step along the way. And when you look at it, some pretty interesting results. The first one is, and I can't, again, I can't say the end of life because we don't have an end of life yet, but as it sat there, that, that the structure had a negative carbon footprint. There was more carbon sequestered in that wood than that was used in all of the steps involved in that process. No other material can make that claim. Not even bamboo. Bamboo doesn't even come close to being able to make that same claim. Only wood can do that. Whoops. The second part that was interesting, the largest single contributor as far as carbon emissions for that entire project were the concrete footers we had to put on the ground to hold it. And those were done locally. That added more to the carbon footprint than all of the other parts of it combined. And the third one, and this is where it starts to get interesting because as we sat there and people climbed up it and looked and they said, yeah, this is great, and it looks nice, and it's pretty, but how many trees did you have to cut down to make this? And this is where we need to change the debate. This is where we need to change the conversation from how many trees did you need to cut down to how quickly are those trees replaced? And this is when we've began now a whole new campaign where you can, you can you know, by looking at the FAA data and the growth to removal ratios, you can see how quickly wood of different species grows. So all the wood that was used in that project, including the waste wood, represents 96 seconds worth of growth in the forest. So in the time that this slide has been up, all of the wood that was used in this project has already been replaced in the forest. We took this step even a step further and worked with some of the leading architects around the world last year to do just, again, small pieces using thermally modified, but doing, again, full environmental impacts of them. And it raises a lot of interesting questions, and we've started now to get um, architectural digest type magazines, national magazines, The Economist magazine interested in this debate because you start drilling down and looking at this. This was a, an, an interesting ladder that uh, Terence Conran, who's a very famous um, architect designer in the UK, for his library. He wanted this, this uh, um, ladder to get up to get the books out of his library, but he's you know, approaching his 80s now and he said he had a real problem because he'd get to the top of the, top of the ladder, he'd pull a book out, climb down the ladder, look at it, oh, it's not the book I want, I've got to go back up. So he wanted a ladder that had a seat at the top and, of course, a table for his glass of wine as well, so he could go up to the top, open the books, look at it, make sure they're the books he wanted. So this was built, nothing spectacular, but from an environmental point of view, you look at it, the whole thing, the carbon footprint is 106 kilograms, okay, out of that entire thing. But half of the carbon footprint is this little piece of leather right there. So that adds as much to the carbon footprint as all of the rest of that ladder combined, including shipping the lumber from the U.S. to London to begin with. And again, looking at all the pieces that were used, 13 cubic meters, 13 cubic meters is two seconds worth of growth. And again, that number, when you start talking to journalists, when you start talking to the press, two seconds, really? I don't believe that. How do you figure that? So we've started now a full um, ad campaign that's going to be running around the world. You'll see it in a second where we're taking this as the um, as a next step. We built for the American Pavilion at the, at the Expo in Milan. Um, we did nothing spectacular, but a nice solid white oak floor. And again, the whole thing is designed around that, this floor, and I think it's 500 square meters of white oak floor. 
25 seconds. So again, this is on the wall as people come in and look at it, and sustainability is the whole um, theme of the U.S. pavilion there. Um, so people come in in this, this lovely wood, and then when you, when you assume that, how long do you think it takes that wood to grow? Oh, 90 years, 100 years. No, actually, it's 25 seconds, and that wood is replaced in the forest. And that, those kinds of numbers, you start getting people to think in that way about how the wood is replaced and focusing not just on if you have to cut down trees, but how it comes back. And this is what's, uh, what's launched the whole new campaign that we're doing called Grown in Seconds to get a time that's both for, uh, um, you know, for your iPhones or for, or for the computer, go on growninseconds.com and play with it a little bit. It gives all different, different projects, talks about the environmental impacts of it, and talks about how long it takes those things to grow in the forest. One of them, of course, this was uh, made, out of American, uh, made out of ash, but out of the thermally modified ash. And that's it. I'm going to end with that and love to take any questions, but I know we've got the uh, cocktail hour coming up next, so I don't want to stand in the way of that. Um, thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Snow. Um, so I will open the floor to questions. If you uh, have any, please feel free to ask. Yes. Yep. All cherries that grows at one net. Yep. Okay. Yep. Do you and it's just and it's just a little misleading though for somebody to see. I mean, I, I get what you're saying. And, yeah. And it's it's great, but for somebody to see that, like, really, it's 40 seconds. Even. Well, we went we, we went back and forth on the best ways to present it, and actually in the, in in a couple of the areas where we've translated, like when we went into you know translating into Chinese, actually the character they ended up using was replaced in. 40 seconds, so replay, you know, and um, so there, 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 you know, was that discussion, but essentially what we're saying is this amount of wood is grown net, and so net of mortality in the forest in this much time, and it's explained on the website, because it, you know, it has come up, but we wanted to be provocative, we wanted people to go, oh, what does that mean, and we want people to look into it, because the more people look into things, and what are you talking about, it's carbon negative, that big piece of you know, staircase there, and it's been shipped all over the world. How can that be carbon negative? We want people to look into it. You know, we want, because the more that people do the actual research and start taking a look at wood and not just their preconceived notion that cutting down a tree is bad, the more they do the actual research, the better off wood ends up looking. But your point is well taken, and it was a lot of discussions um, before we settled on it. I see it with all the other industries, whether yeah. No, we're, 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 inviting the, we're inviting the conversation. And actually, that's the thing is we, we ran this first in the UK. And of course, when you're making environmental claims in the UK, you've got to submit it ahead of time. And you know, the Cotton Council in the US ran into trouble a couple of years ago running an ad campaign on sustainable cotton. Or I can't remember the exact details of it. But essentially, they got a cease and desist order from the UK government that, that, their, that their advertising was misleading. So we've submitted it in advance. And you know, we, we welcome the. You know, we, we want people to be asking questions. Thank you. I guess uh, Sylvain might have a question. We've been using a lot um, architects, 
primarily. Because we found, you know, at, 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 when, you're, when you're talking about trying to move the needle on, on, on um, you know, fashion and what people are using, you know, the architects, um, they'll listen to other architects. They're not going to come and listen to me speak, but they'll, they'll listen to other architects. Um, so the, you know, the idea is, you know, you create, you know, champions from there. And, and we've been lucky enough to get, you know, people like Norman Foster and Zaka Hadid, some of the biggest names in the world in architecture that have, you know, jumped, you know, head on into this, that do understand life cycle and do understand materials usage and, and have been very willing participants. Are you going to pay for No. I, 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 I don't want to speak ill, so I won't say anything, but I think... I, I, it's, it's, and that's one thing that's raised a lot of times when I go in, you yeah. know, around the world. Oh, well, you know, the U.S., you have, you know, the Green Building Council and your LEED system. And I say, yeah, but the LEED system doesn't measure environmental impacts. It measures points. And, and I don't even want to get into it. I mean, you get points for having a bicycle rack, really, but you don't get points for using wood unless it's FSC certified. It's, it's ridiculous. When you have a green building system that doesn't have an empirical way to show that it's greener than a non-certified building, that's a problem. That's a problem. But again, our industry, domestically in particular, in the US, our industry is mute. So that was able to develop because we weren't at the table. It's that simple. There is no domestic industry, no, no, nothing in the US domestically doing what we're doing overseas. And we can't do anything in the US, so we don't do anything in the US either. But nobody is doing that kind of outreach in the US. And when you're silent, you're easy to ignore. And that's been our industry's problem for too long. Thank you. I guess there was another question out here. Was it Mark? Yeah. Yes. But do we have a strategy for the DMC in the, in the architects? For it to uh, be a problem from a site or? In the US side? Yeah. No. no. Nope. Nope. Our mandate is export promotion. So we can't, we can't even spend any money in the US. No, nope. they talked about it for the last few years and decided they didn't want to do it. You're talking about a checkoff? Checkoff, yeah. Because you do a job. <laughs> <laughs> the shape of that, that's nice. <laughs> that's a good job. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.